Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek podcast number 256. And I'm John Davis. And joining me today are riding two-wheeling reporter Brian Robinson. Good morning, everyone. Over the edge reporter, Greg Carlos. Hey, hey. And our online content coordinator, Jessica Ray. Hey, everybody. Thank you all for joining and thanks everybody out there for joining. And we have got some cars to talk about today and they're actually ones that we have driven, which is uh, almost amazing. I think the first time in over a year we can actually say that. So we're gonna get right into it with probably the most talked about and anticipated new member of the full-size truck uh, business that I can think of. I believe we first started hearing about the uh, all-electric Ford F-150 maybe three years ago. Ford F-150 Lightning and Brian Robinson, you have been up close and personal, so tell us what we're looking at. Oh, I haven't actually driven this one, but- Close uh, to it though, you, you know more about it than anybody else. For, uh, for sure. The uh, First of all, the, it's the F-150 Lightning, which I think is brilliant name. Yeah. And uh, I think it's it'll be faster than all the SVT Lightnings everywhere. So it shouldn't get a whole lot of controversy over that. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot to talk about. So I'm just going to ramble and someone will have to jump in and cut me off at some point. First but, of all, uh, does, it, does it look that much different than an F-150? So Ford wanted it to look and behave exactly like a regular F-150, making battery power just another powertrain choice, mm -hmm. not creating a unique vehicle. And uh, with few exceptions, this is the case. Uh, up front, it does have a very traditional looking grill with uh, unique LEDs, of course. There's a, a light bar that runs across the top of the grill that connects them. Uh, does the same thing in the back across the top of the tailgate, connecting the tail lights. Uh, charge port is on the driver's side, front fender. There's unique bumpers that are a little more rounded. Basically, all the aluminum body panels have been subtly reshaped to enhance aerodynamics. Basically so, it, tidy. so it is a little different on the outside. A little. I mean, when you see it coming down the road, uh, it's well, just going to look like an F-150. Right. You look at it up close, you can see some differences. It, I think it looks a little bit better than a regular F-150, but I think if you, you know, a keen eye who's tuned into EVs and uh, like plug-in hybrids will notice that the wheels are flat, like a flatter design for mm -hmm. aerodynamics. It's like a, a dead giveaway for something that's going for efficiency. So, and inside, it's built to the exact same dimensions as the current F-150. So uh, just like you wouldn't know if you're in a diesel or gas engine just by sitting in it, it's the exact same here. It's all F-150. Now, despite all of that underneath, it's obviously vastly uh, different. It's got an all new frame. Um, the frame packages all of the batteries and, and both electric motors. They're all standard, all wheel drive hmm. inside uh, between the frame rails. So everything's tucked up out of the way and protected. And uh, I mentioned suspension, uh, another uh, big difference, fully independent rear suspension on the frame. Uh, not the first for a full-size truck, obviously, but first for Ford. I was gonna say, I don't think they've ever done that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and as far as the details, 560-ish horsepower, um, 775 pound-feet of torque, it'll tow 10,000 pounds. And uh, a lot of, like a lot of EVs coming out right now, they seem to be, the extended range batteries seem to be at that 300 mile range. Uh, the standard battery will be probably 220, 240, somewhere around there. And uh, probably one of the coolest part of the vehicle uh, with no engine up front, uh, the grill is attached to the hood. And when you lift it up, just a huge cargo area down there. Um, and they even went way down, almost all the way down to the frame. Uh, you can pull the floor up. There's just a ton more storage. It's almost like opening the back of a Ford Edge. Uh, with the amount of uh, cargo space there. Great idea, extremely well executed. Ford's also embracing the idea of basically being a mobile power station. So if you buy their charger, when you get the vehicle and you lose power at your home, your ha house will just seamlessly start drawing power from the F-150. And you can run it for up to three days, according to them. Yeah. And you could just go drive somewhere, charge your truck back up and 
plug back in and power your home for however long you need to. Uh, pricing under forty thousand dollars for like the contractor special. But that's uh, that's mm, really significant. Right? It's not under though. With destination, they haven't. It's not going to be under technically. But, but still, forty. Well, yeah, grand. but that, it's also it's also yeah. before incentives too. Yeah, a mid-level XLT, uh, low fifties, mid fifties. So it's almost very similar to. You know, if you get the five liter V8 uh, pricing wise, which is, uh, I think, pretty amazing. Yeah. It's going to be uh, really important. A ton ton of tech, of course, being an F-150. The uh, It's got onboard scales that'll tell you to the pound how much your trailer weighs. Uh, they really up the game as far as the uh, range prediction. It takes traffic and weather into account, um, as well as your GPS route. And uh, it'll constantly monitor your range and give you all available charging options. I was blown away by the price because that's probably uh, to start 20 grand less than, you know, everybody else has been talking about a lot of the upstarts uh, and they've done the pro model, which is what that base price is. Uh, and it looks ready to go to work and price where even a small contractor could probably afford it. The only thing that gives me any pause is the 10,000, thousand pounds like one of the publicity photos and the one we ran on our uh, website was it towing a trailer and i'm thinking yeah how far can that tow? that's what no one will talk about that towing is going to suck those batteries down but very impressive very impressive how about you uh everybody else i mean what did you think when you saw it to the, to the pricing point you know i you have to commend for it on doing that yeah. i don't know what the breakdown is going to be on how much money they make on these early on because Probably zero. You, know, you gotta i mean they're kind of putting their money where their mouth is saying like hey we want people to use these things we believe in our truck mm -hmm. uh you know we're not building it so that only the elite people can buy it so like let, let's get it out there let's let's make it enticing for people to want to adopt this new technology so that that's pretty cool As, you know i'm a huge fan of the lightning name i'm glad they brought that back it just makes sense um Back to the whole uh, frunk thing, this might be the most literal frunk out of all frunks because like Robinson had said, is uh, it's quite literally a, a trunk on the front of the car because of the way it pulls the grill up. So you're not like leaning over to mm -hmm. put stuff in there like you are in the, uh, the Mach-E. I mean, it opens up flat and you have, you know, basically what I would imagine is maybe like hip level of like sliding something into uh, the frunk which they say can fit, uh, as uh, you know, John says, the Detroit standard of two golf bags. Two golf bags. <laughs> yeah. It always it used to, I'm not a golfer, so it used to always amuse me, but that was always the standard. Jessica, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, price point is correct. I think this is a truck that, I mean, I think people jump the gun and they're like, well, this is just, you know, this won't work for so many people. And that's true. I, I don't think that this is a truck that every single current no. F-150 owner can own when it comes out. Um, but we've talked multiple times about how people buy these pickup trucks and they don't use them to do pickup truck things necessarily. Personal use, they're personal use vehicles. Exactly, so having the, the, the base being under 250 mile range, seems correct to me. I mean, so many people will not exceed that for, you know, taking things even just, you know, to the local dump or, you know, or around doing work around your own house. Like, um, so to me, it just seems like they, they hit, they hit the spot correctly for, you know, launching this thing into the market for, um, the average consumer to buy. I love the aspect of being able to use it as a home generator or work site generator. And, you know, three days, that's a long time to be able to use something like that. So now offset that with the cost of a whole home generator, those, uh, those can easily run you six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 to install. And that's like a really nice extra Benny. Brian, do you, is, is, is that standard or is that an option? I imagine it's an option. That's... I believe standard, but you have to buy their specific charger as far as making it seamless. Like I imagine, uh, you know, you could make it work however you needed to make it work, but supposedly it's seamless if you use their uh, charger, which they didn't right. say how much that would cost. So 
the ultimate rig would be since it tows so much get one of those big industrial generators and uh <laughs> diesel power generators and just tow that <laughs> tow that with you wherever you go and you would never have to plug it in so, <laughs> and probably that buy is diesel. a wonderful solution yeah, <laughs> probably buy diesel like once a week and then just uh yeah wherever you go oh very very well done that was very well done well, we got to stay on the subject of, um, of new and interesting and uh, somewhat innovative vehicles, but we're going to get away from the EV aspect for a little bit. Um, Jessica, you just came back from driving the new Subaru Outback Wilderness, this toughened up Outback, which, which no one's really talked about, but it's kind of ironic because the whole Outback thing began as a toughening up of you know some of Subaru's all-wheel drive products and now they've taken it to this next step and not only tell us what it is and what it looks like but why did they do it yeah so um wilderness essentially is now a rugged I mean that's what that's the word they used was rugged, rugged outback um and you can sort of tell just looking at it from the exterior um, they essentially did a Chrome delete, which seems to be very popular with um, a lot of these like off-road, um, you know, uh, uh, vehicles that they're coming out with. So um, the there's a lot of black on it. And I like so in your first in your first drive, you mentioned that they called the uh, matte black sticker on the hood an anti glare sticker or something like that. That yeah. was just funny marketing to me. Yeah, that's what they're touting it as, is this anti-glare hood decal. So there's a matte black anti-glare hood decal right on the, right on the front. Um, it has a new grill um, that's specific to the wilderness. It has these, the bumper, the front bumper really comes up very close to the headlights. Um, the fender flares are at a little bit extra width to the wilderness. So the dimensions are just a little different but they stick out a little bit in case you bump into something off-road. Um, the wheels are uh, 17 inches, which is uh, different from the typical 18 inch wheels that they have. They're also black. Um, but probably one of the big things is that it has this new ladder type roof rack on it that can hold 700 pounds of static weight. And I believe it is 200, 220 pounds of dynamic roof load. So essentially when you're driving, you can have 220 pounds. When you're just sitting still, you can have 700 pounds. They had a whole tent set up there yeah. where you, we climbed up and you got to like hang out in the tent up there. So it was, that was really, really interesting. How long did you hang out in the tent up there? What'd you <laughs> do? <laughs> not, not that long, <laughs> but it was pretty yeah. stable. Did you cover uh, extra ground clearance? Is there something there oh. that... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Extra ground clearance removed from 8.7 to 9.5. Um, and you, you actually drove it quite extensively off road. So, yeah, I mean, we know this is a midsize wagon that's capable in all weather. How was it off road? It was, I, I, it surprised me for sure. Especially because when we're talking about like specs wise, but with the engine and the transmission, it isn't too much different from a typical Outback. The engine is still the same, the 2.4 liter uh, i4 turbo or the turbo four. Um, it's got 260 horsepower. And then it still has that, uh, the CVT as a transmission, which um, of course people are like, put a stick in it if it's a true no. off-roader. No, it isn't. Um, but they've optimized everything so that I didn't really feel that lazy sensation when I was taking it off-road. Um, it seemed very capable of uh, getting through mud. We went in a river where I, I don't know how deep it was, but I was not opening my door. Like it, it was <laughs> high enough. So you did, you know, you, you did a little river forging. In it, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, which, which surprised me. I was like, are they seriously <laughs> letting us do that? Um, but what it does have is this dual mode, uh, this new uh, X drive, all wheel drive system which um, has a, an advanced setting for like deep mud and snow and that sort of thing. And it also stays on after two, 25 miles per hour. So typically it would turn off yeah. because 
you know, you're usually only using it to get yourself out of like a tricky situation or something like that in, you know, a typical Outback. Um, but in this case, it is so that you can just keep it on and just keep going to where you need to go. Because in the end, that's the point of the wilderness trim mm -hmm. in general, is that it's supposed to get you to a place that you probably wouldn't be able to get to in a typical Outback. That's what they want. How about it, guys? Any comments? I think the Outback's endurance over these years has been pretty amazing, embracing kind of that rugged lifestyle before it was even cool to do so and selling wagons when no one else even uh, can. But uh, it's always been super capable. Uh, now it's just a little more so. Funny uh, Outback story, if I may, if we have time. Sure. Uh, I, was out in Cal I was out in California on this uh, ATV and side-by-side -side trip. And we're driving through all these trails and the PR guys like really talking about how capable these vehicles are and all this stuff. And the trails were on, they're not that like technical, but you know, it was off-roading. And we get to this one part, he's like, okay, guys, this is the toughest part yet. You know, hopefully we can get through this. So we, we go through everything and we get to the other side and there's a little parking area. We're parking there and he gets out. He's like, wow, you know, these things are so capable. And like, as soon as he starts talking, this Subaru Outback comes driving through the same area we just drove through, totally stock. <laughs> and, then, and then the guy's like, all right, well, uh, I guess we should get out of here now. <laughs> Typical oh. PR stuff. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I remember when they uh, first kind of went after the, the rugged uh, off-road and, and they were following Volvo, basically, with the cross country. And I remember taking a Volvo wagon that's, you know, a little bit larger than the Subaru Outback at that time, up some horrific trails. So, I mean, a lot of these vehicles are extremely capable even before you start lifting them up. I'm sorry, Greg, I cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm, I can't stop looking at the wheels, man. It's my favorite part. It's a beautiful black design, like real, you know, thick, rugged looking. Uh, I feel like you know, looking at the colors here that, it's kind of weird the the white with the with the black looks cool but then you get into these like aquas and like blues that kind of look toyish i don't know uh the green always looks cool in an off-roading uh vehicle but uh yeah i don't know i you kind of have to think you think long and hard about your color choice or else it might not yeah. be taken seriously <laughs> well, that blue that blue in a lot of the footage that's the wilderness blue it's not called wilderness blue. I think it's geys geyser geyser blue. I think that's what they're calling it. Um, but that that's the that's the like blue that they made for this. If if you're gonna <laughs> choose that color, I'd say make sure there's mud on it all the time because uh, I think it would look really <laughs> cool with a little bit of brown mixed in there. Seems like uh, this is gonna be the first of their wilderness. I actually think that uh, as they spread it through their lineup, uh, they, they're probably gonna be onto something. I mean, that's what they basically did uh, with the original Outback, Outback theme spread around. But uh, thinking about the Forester uh, wilderness, which they've already talked about, uh, I think that will be even a bigger hit in this particular mode. Cross track. That's where yep. it's at. Yeah, cross track. Oh, I yeah, I tried to ask and see, hey, what are the plans? And they were they didn't say, but oh yeah, were, of course. We're just we're just focusing on we're just the, focused. the outback. I mean, I think that's the second phrase or they learn in, in public relations school <laughs> in the automotive realm. Uh, they, the first, you know, we can't first talk about I'll, that or whatever. Yeah, first is I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. They did say though, um, that I well, we should probably say. But this is coming, it's supposed to come this summer. Um, fingers crossed, though, because they did chip. mention chip shortage. So, yeah, amazing. Speaking of stuff that uh, is coming down the pipeline, we hope, uh, Greg, you have news on the Volkswagen Taos, their uh, smallest SUV in this country ever. Is that right? Uh, and ever, I can't right. confirm or deny that, but it's definitely right. smaller than the Tiguan. Well, certainly smaller, the, the smallest here, I guess. Go ahead. Yeah. So, Tell us uh, what yeah, it is. It, uh, so 2022 Volkswagen Taos is now their entry level SUV because they sell more SUVs than cars. They're like everybody else at this yeah. point. Tiguan is a bestseller for them. Atlas is selling well for them. So, you know, it makes sense that they finally get one below the uh, Tiguan, which, um, you know, like I just said, is, is already their bestseller. 
so this was debuted all the way back in October. Uh, yeah. And I finally just got to drive it now uh, the other day, just down, went down south a few miles into Northern Virginia. And it, um, you know, size wise, it's nine inches shorter overall than the Tiguan, which is, if you're unfamiliar with what Volkswagen does, they essentially pick a segment, an SUV segment, and then they say, let's make it bigger than everything else in the segment. So the Tiguan so it's a big is compact. The Sigwan, yeah, the, the Tiguan, you know, technically goes up against like RAV4 and things like that, but you can get a third row in the Tiguan if you stick yeah. with all or uh, front wheel drive. So this one, uh, the Taos goes up against things like Subaru Crosstrek, Jeep Compass, uh, Kia Celso. Oh, really? We so technically it's a subcompact, but those is, really don't mean anything anymore. Correct. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a subcompact, but it's technically in that category. So manufacturers just kind of do whatever they want. It's like when they call an SUV a coupe and have four doors on it, you just, yeah, whatever. Okay. Well you call it one thing, I'll call it another. Uh, but the good news is, is if you're a fan of headroom and legroom, this thing has it because there is a ton of it, uh, rear seat leg room as i usually do when i drive these test cars i set my front seat up and then i'll sit behind myself and uh plenty of leg room for somebody who's six three tons of headroom um you, you can option in i think twelve hundred dollars for a panoramic sunroof um digital cockpit is standard across the board which for an entry level suv is pretty cool um you know it's a it's a beautiful looking gauge cluster it's uh, comprehensive it's it's modern looking and you can customize it. So all really cool. But as far as driving, uh, that longer wheelbase helps in this segment, comparing it to a Kia Seltos, which we have as a long-term, kind of gets bumpy with that shorter wheelbase. Uh, this one's nice. It, it drives well, not a ton of power from the 1.5 liter turbo four. Uh, it's 158, uh, about 180 four pound feet of torque. So it's torquey. It felt like there was always torque a, a, available. Um, and to that point, uh, they, they've also done something a little bit differently. If you go front wheel drive, you still get the same engine, but you get a eight speed torque converter automatic transmission, which is a traditional smooth operating transmission. Uh, if you go to the all wheel drive, you actually get the seven speed DSG, which is their dual clutch transmission. It's a little more, uh, I guess performance oriented in a Volkswagen, um, it shifts much quicker. Uh, did they give a honest, reason? Did they say why they did that? Cause that I seems like get, an expensive. I think they just out. want the, the all wheel drive, which they call four motion. Uh, they just want it to kind of separate itself and be more of the fun to drive one. Because in addition to the DSG, the rear suspension is different. So the base front wheel drive, you have a torsion beam, which is a pretty basic rear, uh, suspension setup going to all-wheel drive you now have a multi-link independent rear uh, which is really just a more sophisticated suspension it uh, it handles better when you drive it more spiritedly this isn't really a performance suv so right. you know take that for what it is but overall it's just it's a it's a better ride uh, it, it look it looks uh, like another member of the family a lot like the atlas what did, what do you think of the uh, styling and so forth is there anything distinctive about it? Yeah, the the what I mentioned was that it's more of like driving a mini Atlas than a Tiguan. I, I think it shares more styling with the uh, Atlas than it does the Tiguan. It has the like kind of the uh, the, the upright windshield. Uh, it looks more SUV ish, I guess, more boxy than a Tiguan, which the Tiguan itself just got refreshed, uh, and that kind of goes a little bit more upscale. To separate itself more from the Taos, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's probably a little more, and I use this term very uh, loosely, rugged, uh, because it's not really a rugged SUV. But if you had to categorize the style as opposed to a Tiguan, I'd say it's a little bit more rough around the edges. So Jessica, what is the internet saying about it, or um, what are our viewers saying about it? I think well, I think people styling wise it's a little mundane for them um which i guess i can agree with but i also respect in many ways because i think some so many people are like this is ugly or this is too extreme or something like that so um but it looks big and i think people see that it does look big 
Of course, you know, with Volkswagen, a lot of times people, uh, when they see the powertrain um, options or the singular engine option that's in there now, I think they are uh, underwhelmed because of it being considered underpowered. Um, but I, so I think it's, and, I, and also I think people are like, they're, they're launching the, this Taos and then they also launched the ID4. So are they backtracking? You know, where does EV, um, their transition to EV come into this? So I think people are a little bit confused about what Volkswagen's up to. I think they're hedging their bets. Brian <laughs> Robinson, we haven't heard from you. Uh, so I did a brief scan through the press release and it mentions the interior is, interior is designed to appeal to the youthful intended buyer uh, with modern shapes and colors. Can you describe those modern shapes and colors to our listeners, Greg? <laughs> awesome, thanks for that setup. I, uh, I guess a modern shape now is like very like wide and simple, but it's like a sharp rounded. It's sharp that, that rounded. Makes sense. It's like, okay. yeah, so we, <laughs> we went through an automotive phase where everything was like aerodynamic and swoopy and you know what I mean? And we also went through a phase earlier than that where everything was like very hard cut lines. Now we're like, I think we're, we're somewhere in between where it's still very horizontal. If you say you're looking at the dash, but when you get to the edges where it comes down to the vertical section, it's like, it's like a little round, it's just like a little rounded. Uh, but as far as like interior colors, there's like two tone with the seats and everything like that. Uh, as far as the technology, like I said, digital cockpit, you have the touchscreen standard, um, you know, just being able, and then uh, USB. Um, so I, I don't know how many people are familiar with different types of USBs, but everybody's moving to USB-C, whereas most people probably think of USB-A as the drives, drives me crazy I think in it still is, but Nothing fits. I have to go get adapters. And it's, Thanks for clearing that up, Greg. Mm -hmm. I'm also just a little bit rounded. So I'm going to consider that a youthful shape from now on. <laughs> oh boy, I'd like to drink what you drank this morning. Thanks everybody. That was a good synopsis on three very, very interesting vehicles that uh, are coming down the pike very quickly and into our uh, lot, I hope pretty soon. Let's move on though to um, some news of a couple of models going away for our lightning round. Uh, Mazda recently announced the demise of two of their models, the Mazda 6 sedan and the CX-3 subcompact crossover. Uh, we love the Mazda 6, always have, but it's not surprising that it's getting dropped as a result of waning interest in this country for sedans. But the CX-3 is, um, you know, that's in a very high demand segment. Does that signal any problems for Mazda? Why do you think they did it? No. Uh, say, oh, good, Jessica. <laughs> I was just gonna say no, <laughs> because um, I think the CX-30 came in and did sort of what Mazda thought it was gonna do. And- um, Which is kill the CX-3. <laughs> yeah, basically, it's which bigger. is almost silly because it's almost like you could have just redesigned the CX-3 to be CX-30 size. But anyway, um, no, I mean, it, it's pretty clear when you look at the sales between 2019 and 2020 that um, the shift of the sales from like the Mazda 6 and the CX-3 really went into um, the CX-30, um, which has been performing really well for Mazda. So, um, I mean, that's just less money in production that they have to pay and all of those cycle into just one vehicle. So um, now I don't think it's bad news for Mazda, bad news for people who love Mazda sedans. So definitely. Yeah. Guys. Yeah, I would agree. It's not not at all bad news for Mazda. They're just following current trends. Um, as Jessica said, when that CX-30 came out, the CX-3's days were absolutely numbered. Um, I think I'm on record in previous podcasts wondering why anyone would buy a CX-3 to begin with when they could get a Mazda 3 uh, has more room for less money. So anyway, uh, as far as the 6 sedan, I will absolutely uh, missed that one, but I imagine uh, it was just a matter of time. Yeah. Greg, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think I would end up just repeating basically everything they said. I to 
I always thought the CX-3 was way too small. And the CX-30, when that came out, I was like, great, they finally did it right. So the only trouble, I guess, it would signal was like whoever made the decision to do the CX-3 and then like come out with the CX-3. I don't know. I don't know the whole global story behind it. Uh, it was just, you know, it. I don't. I could care less about the CX-3, honestly, going away. But I, I do. I will miss the Mazda 6. I've owned one, and uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and complain about the demise of sedans. But I guess I should have gone out and bought more. I can remember when we got the original CX-3 in, and Brian hit the nail on the head. We said it's based on the Mazda 3. It doesn't have as much room inside. The the cargo area. Was or was it based on the Mazda two? No, yeah, it was actually yeah. based on the Mazda two. Mazda there. two, and I remember opening up the cargo bay and saying how small it was, and I think we did write that you know the uh, the uh, Mazda three actually had more room, so it, it doesn't surprise me. But it was also one of the earlier uh, really small SUVs, so it was at the beginning of the trend. And you're right, why in the world didn't they just redo the CX three and? call it the 30. Uh, now, that does leave us still a hole in their lineup. And the rumor that I think surfaced just this week is that there's a CX-5 or maybe it'll be a CX-50 that's coming pretty soon. Um, the 30, of course, is also the basis of a lot of their electrification. So uh, we're not sure where that's going to go either. But well, go ahead. It's, yeah, it's similar to what Nissan did with the Juke. You know, they yeah. were early on. And I think they really thought they had to play up the sport sporty aspects of these small utilities to really sell them. But, you know, it turns out people just want small utilities. They don't really care about that stuff. They just want a small utility that still has a lot of room and drives nice, which is not at all what this CX-3 was about. Yeah, very good. Okay, so it's too bad about the sedan, but we're not surprised at all about the uh, CX-3. I've always thought the Mazda uh, 6 and all of its predecessors going at, back all the way to the 626 we're just uh, terrific automobiles. Okay, we have a viewer question. And I have to say, this is a very, very, very interesting one uh, from Preston. He said, I recently added the 2019 VW Rabbit Edition Golf six-speed manual to our family. It has forward emergency braking. How does that work with the manual transmission? Have you tested any manuals with emergency braking? I'm not sure we uh, don't do that emergency braking test as routinely as we used to. And I'm not sure if we ever actually did do it with a manual where we run into a barrier, but uh, what do you think's the answer uh, to his question? Robinson and I talked off air about this. Um, I, I can give you the, from what I've understood and I've never tested one myself, uh, especially not a Volkswagen, but I'm, I'm pretty sure BMW uh, has it as well. Yes, they and, do and it just stalls is the answer if you don't push the clutch in so it'll it'll still fully break and everything it'll do its best to get you down to a stop which even still you know manufacturers are a little bit weird about what they say like whether or not it brings you to a full stop it may not be every time because i think legally they have to say that yeah. uh, but if if it were to happen in this car and you didn't depress the clutch uh it's going to stall and you'll have to restart it right it'll definitely stall you out but i think what he'll recognize if he ever uh, if it ever triggers uh if you drive a manual all the time you your left leg will instantly hit that clutch pedal as soon as you start braking without you even thinking about it which will probably keep you from stalling but there you know manuals aren't alone like when we first started doing those automatic braking tests uh a lot of cars would totally shut down yes they did uh yeah when, they, when it got triggered and uh, even CVTs to this day, like when just at the regular track going the 60 mile an hour to zero, sometimes those things will totally not know what to do uh, in an emergency braking situation. You have to wait a couple seconds before they figure out that you're stopped now before they, uh, they'll actually work. So just uh, manual transmissions aren't alone in, uh, in that. It's worth noting that every system will will beep and do some sort of visual warning too. So even before it breaks, you know, subconsciously, you'll probably be getting your left foot ready on that clutch because it's not like, you know, immediately you're stopped and stalled. I mean, you get a warning real quick. And if you're falling back on the clutch, which a lot of people do in an emergency situation, I think you're like Robinson said, your foot's just going to go over there. Anything to add, Jess? No, no, nothing to add I, there. But uh, you guys are absolutely right from uh, what I've, been able to discern 
stalling is a big issue and good again for Brian for remembering. I'm, I can remember a lot of the road tests where you would see the car, you know, an automatic come to a stop and our braking test and you would hear it restart before it could drive away. So they're not long. Preston, uh, enjoy it. And I, if you're proficient in a manual, I think you'll find, uh, as uh, everyone has said, that uh, you're going to instantly put in that clutch anyway. Otherwise, just restart it and go. Ho hopefully you'll stop and won't hit anything. Gee, we've come to the rant and rave section of the podcast. Anyone got anything uh, on either side of that marker today? A, a small journalist rant. Uh, now that it seems like more manufacturers are making um, the screens more driver oriented, so they'll tilt it toward the driver. Mm -hmm. um, when you get into one that is not tilted toward the driver and say the screen is directly facing to the rear windshield, um, it kind of throws me off a little bit. I feel like we're on to something with the whole driver oriented uh, screen setup. So why not just make that the standard? What about like your I passengers? Said, what what I, about the front seat passenger? Aren't they going to complain? I mean, Greg just cares about himself. <laughs> what? Greg just cares about himself. <laughs> it's very true. I mean, it, if it if it affects me, I have a problem. But you know, anybody else, I don't care. <laughs> We're I mean, I, I think I would agree with that a little bit, mostly, but I, not for the same reasons, probably because my issue is I get into a lot of cars and my, my, my arm doesn't reach far enough. Uh -huh. So if you have a touch screen and I'm having to like, I mean, I already sit pretty darn close to the steering wheel. Cause I am just like a solid five feet yeah. tall. I was, I was going to say, I've gotten in the car after you. And actually I <laughs> didn't get in the car because I physically could not get in the car after you were in there. <laughs> I always forget. Like I try to remember to like put the seat back. Cause I know that no matter who gets in the car after me, they're going to be at least like five inches taller than I am. Um, so I know I try to be cognizant of that. <laughs> I, I got to tell you a story. I, from day one, I have complained about that when the uh, some of the vertically uh, challenged members of our staff have put the seats way up and you can't get in to get them back. And their retort to me is, well, well how about us? You tall guys get in there and then we have to spend 30 seconds getting repositioned again. So I guess it, uh, on both sides, it, but at least they can get in. Yeah, I mean, exactly like, right. At least you if, get good in. if you, Jessica, to actually think about doing that. I think what if I was being chased by an angry fan <laughs> who I've undoubtedly made mad and I have to get in and the, I can't get into the car? <laughs> I know these are things I really should think of. Although, <laughs> you know, when I when I get into it after like, I don't think it's you, Greg, but maybe like Dave. Dave and it's Gerber, like who's the tallest, I guess, on the staff. I seriously cannot see over the steering wheel. Like I'm, I feel like a baby, like in the seat. That's how small I am. Now we're talking about how the seats are laid back. <laughs> that's a, that just drives me crazy. You get in there and you're looking at the headliner. Uh, I'm guilty of that. That's probably I, that's, me. To each his own. That's why they have those, so many cars have those. Depends on how I'm driving. I don't yeah. do that at the track, but if I'm just <laughs> driving home. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I think there's there's a few folks on the the Motor Week staff who like to just lay back and. Uh, but I have I I have a rant that's sort of related to this because I have an issue sometimes with the way seats like rise and the way that you can adjust them essentially because every now and again I will get into a vehicle where, it, especially maybe if it's like a larger vehicle. Um, but I've ha it's happened in smaller vehicles where I, I mean, I put the seat all the way up. I, that's, that's just how I have to drive. And sometimes I feel like it's just not high enough, whether it's the combination of like, they didn't, you know, it could go a little bit higher or like a hood being too large for me to see over. But every now and again, I'll get into a vehicle where I'm like, this really did, like did somebody under like five foot even like sit in this before they thought about it um which worries me sometimes because if I, th I I think about how like um so many women now are driving like huge these large mm -hmm. SUVs like that's their family car you know these the the new GM full size holy moly those are big trucks yeah. um I think my biggest problem was in um uh it was not the 
Armada, but it was the, uh, the QX80, the Infinity QX80. I just felt like it didn't get me up high enough, for, especially because of how curvy that front hood is. So that's my rant is think a little bit more before. I, um, I yeah. think you're absolutely in the right ballpark. I think from day one, we have been complaining about the, uh, the range of seat uh, height adjustment is not sufficient on many vehicles, especially to look over the hood. And when you are raising the seats and lowering the seats, a lot of them do it at an angle. It's not straight up or straight down. So you may get your, your footwell position correct and raise the seat and find you're actually going forward and you can't go back anymore. Yep. So uh, with all of the work they do on seat comfort and everything, uh, it's far from perfect. And by the way, that's an incredibly inexact science. Uh, many years ago, we did a segment on it and, you know, a, this, they use all kinds of measurements to measure comfort and everything, but they don't always get it right. Very good. All right. I think that brings us to a close of podcast 256. I want to thank Jessica, Greg, and Brian. It, it was terrific information, everybody. And uh, Brian, your brain works in yes, mysterious sir. ways. <laughs> and we're all thankful for it. Indeed it does. <laughs> And I'd also like to thank our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood, our podcast creator, of course, Greg Carlos, and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Everybody out there, thanks very much for listening and watching our podcast. And by the way, if you're uh, interested in watching uh, our show, of course, uh, go over to motorweek.org, pull down about the show tab at the top, put in your, uh, uh, your zip code. You can find out what public television station near you is showing us and what time. Hop on over to the folks at the Motor Trend Cable Network, where our new shows usually premiere there at 7.30 uh, on Tuesday Eastern time every week. And uh, our youtube.com uh, slash motorweek channel is all the new uh, segments on it and all the old ones too, including uh, our uh, 40th anniversary show, which uh, just was completed and is now up there. Yes, go ahead. Probably plug something if people yeah. are still listening, but this weekend for Memorial Day, we do have a retro review marathon coming up. It's, uh, yeah, this isn't going to go live. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, no. people. I hope you watched Sorry. it, though. Yeah. Oh, well, I no, should I plug. Stay tuned for the next one. Well, I should plug that we will be doing them at least once a month. Yeah. In in a month where there is a bank holiday, it will be during said bank holiday weekend. If there is not a holiday, then it will be on the first of the month. We will have updates on our YouTube channel, on all of our social media pages. So follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. We, we, we know that the, uh, the retro review marathons are very popular. Ben Davis works very hard on them and he's constantly uh, digitizing more and more of our old shows. Uh, so uh, if you're a big fan of that, um, you've got some treats coming and there will, there should be one over the July 4th uh, weekend. Yeah. Yep. Out. Otherwise folks, everybody out there, thank you very much for joining us and thanks for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station. 